Hello investors, thank you for joining me. My name is Michael from Deep Value Returns on Seeking Alpha. Today I want to talk about Firesurf. So Firesurf describes itself as a payment and fintech company. We're going to go through that and why, what it is and what it's not. And we're going to go through why I believe that investors pay 19 times non gap earnings are actually probably overpaying for this investment. So, you know, I'm going to go through some positive and negative aspects and then I'm going to let you make up your own mind, okay? So, as you can see here, its revenue growth rates have meaningfully decelerated uh, after its acquisition of first data. And the business underlying business is kind of growing at approximately 10 to 12% year over year. So that's the ballpark that I want you to think about, this kind of number 10 to 12%. Now, here's the problem, right? So everyone is saying to me, oh, you know, um, Value Act is a, a buying stock here and Value Act bought at, at the higher prices than it trades for right now. So if it's good enough for Value Act, then it's good enough for me. Now, let me make something absolutely clear. You are not Value Act. They are playing a different game. Let them play their game. You focus on your game. Now, here's what it is and what it's not, okay? So the way it describes itself is as, as a, a payments and fintech player, okay? It talks about being a global player, right? Now, let me make something clear. 85% of five sales revenues are domestically driven, okay? So what's happening with Clover in Argentina absolutely makes no difference to the share thesis, to the investment thesis right now, okay? So it's, it's a business, it's a domestic business. Furthermore, as you can see here in this graph, 80% of its business has absolutely nothing to do with fintech. It's roughly split between payments and acceptance, okay? So this is like businesses sometimes label themselves in a certain way to try and get the multiple asserted to it as, you know, an XYZ or the next XYZ or whatever. It's not like that. 80% of the business is roughly split between acceptance and payments. So when you think about acceptance, you kind of think about a payment, a POS, a POS merchant solution platform, right? So point of sale, uh, that's the kind of thing that you're trying to think about here. Meanwhile, when you look at the acceptance business, the fastest growing part of the business is actually its hardware print and card business, okay? So that side of the business was up 30% year over year, but you know, Hardware, it's it's a low margin business. I mean, it's not that attractive, right? Uh, the other side of the business that we can't get too much granularity into, but it's the payment processing business, okay? And if you look at other sides of other businesses, like similar comparables, if you look at, let's say, for example, Marketa, and uh, Marketa is also a payment processing business, you can see that's like a like razor thin best case scenario business. It's, it has a lot of volume, right? It has a lot of volume because you're transacting and, and it's, it's just crazy amount of volume. But the margins that you ultimately get from that commodity side of the business is small. Okay. It's, it, it's not Visa, it's not MasterCard. It, it, they don't have a lot of a moat here. And I know people are saying that they have a lot of moat, but they don't, right? So here in the screen, you can see free cash flow. Okay. The free cash flow for the nine months ended uh, 2021 was down 12% year over year at 2.3 billion, okay? So it's not a business that is rapidly growing free cash flow, okay? Pay attention to the facts. It's not that case. I see people saying, oh, it's a free cash flow monster. I mean, <sighs> anyway, now here's the thing, right? So on the earnings call, they talk about being disciplined capital, alloc the disciplined capital allocation strategy, okay? Now let's just unpick this slightly, okay? The cash flow from operations, not including any acquisitions, not including any capex, 67% was used to buy back shares at higher prices. Think about that for a second, okay? The vast majority, nearly 70% of the, well, the cash flows that is made over the last nine months has been used to buy back shares, okay? And how is the shares? How are the shares moved? They're down 2% year over year. So when all is said and done, we're talking about a two, less than 2%. It actually comes up to closer to 1.5%. So why is that a big issue? And isn't it reasonable that a business would want to buy back its shares when it's so meaningfully undervalued? Now, here's the facts, right? The business carries 21 billion of net debt. If you think about it, its net debt to EBITDA puts it at a 3.2x leverage. Now, for a business that the free cash flow is not growing, as we just discussed a few seconds ago, it's not growing. 
You don't want to carry such a large amount of leverage. You want to be 1x leverage, maybe 1.2 or 1.5% leverage, 1.5 times leverage to EBITDA. You don't want more than, let's say that. And at 3.2 times net leverage, I mean, it's difficult. And then to use that capital to repurchase shares is just mind boggling to me. Now, a lot of people said to me, oh, you know, Michael, this business is priced at 19 times earnings. And when I look elsewhere, everything else is being priced at 19 times sales. That is not true particularly right now in the last few weeks we've seen a lot of tech companies that actually make free cash flow really meaningfully implode and it's a buyer's market out there if you were to say to me okay uh, five serves tries trades for approximately 12 to 14 times uh, non gap earnings i'll, I'll say okay fair enough no that's, that's kind of attractive given the amount of leverage it's got but it's not the case here so i mean i i as i said already i think that in the if you, if you take the backdrop of all this, right, you're looking at a business that requires increasingly bigger acquisitions to move the needle on a stop line. It's a business that is not growing meaningfully faster than about 10 to 12% CAGA. You don't want to be paying 19 times earnings for a business that is growing at 10 to 12 times, uh, 10 to 12% on the top line. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, particularly when you think about the amount of leverage that you have to take. Leverage is, you know, that leverage has to be paid off. That's going to be paid off and it's, it doesn't leave you a lot of free cash to play around with. So anyway, if you want to find out what kind of stocks I'm buying right now, don't forget to check out my marketplace. It's called Deep Value Returns. You can check out what other people said in the reviews, start your due diligence there, check out some of my other work. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.